So I'm Larry Stevens. I'm the curator of biology at the Museum of Northern Arizona. I've been giving a series of talks on Grand Canyon, and today I would like to give you a talk that I call Grand Canyon Stinks, referring here to the darkling beetles, stink beetles that live in this incredible national landscape that we have just north of us here in Northern Arizona. First, I'd like to just remind people of the, the history of the museum with regards to research in this, in this region. Our research legacy is more than 90 years old at this point. People like Walter McDougall, Eddie McKee started doing research here in the as early as 1910 for, uh, for Walter McDougall, I think in 1911, Eddie McKee in the 20s and 30s, uh, looking at the biota, the geology, the plant life, and these incredible natural landscapes we have here around the Museum of Northern Arizona. Steve Carruthers, former curator of biology, the position that I now hold, is, was really a, a key architect in management of, of Grand Canyon and uh, the river corridor there. So uh, he conducted the first ecological inventory, completed that work in 1976. I was lucky enough to actually participate in that. So I've been working on the biology of this region for five decades now. So it's getting to be life's work, I guess. Where are we? So we're talking about Grand Canyon, which is in the middle of the Colorado River drainage. This is a you know, it's a huge drainage basin. It's the river of the Southwest, 628,000 square kilometers, uh, it's about 250,000 square miles. The, the river is uh, 144 miles long and uh, occupies parts of eight states, two countries. It occupies about one eighth of, uh, of the United States. It provides water and power to 40 million people all throughout the throughout the region. It's divided into an upper Colorado River Basin, which is on the Colorado Plateau, and then a different geologic province to the south, the Basin and Range uh, Lower Colorado River uh, Basin. That's a political division, but there is a, a lot of geologic uh, uh, physiology, physiognomy there to be, to be looked at. The intervening area uh, is called the Transition Valleys, uh, lying immediately south of the Mugion Rim, and this is the landscape that we're working in here. So it's, it's, uh, the region is really a, what I call a mega ecotone over, over space and time. The, the reason this area is so fascinating to me as a biologist is it's got um, four biomes across these two geologic provinces. The elevation gradient is pretty much off the charts, three and a half kilometers, more than two miles of, of elevation gradient here. So it's a crossroads of ecosystems through evolutionary space and time. In terms of biodiversity, we've got about 2,500 plant species. This region we call the Grand Canyon Ecoregion, GCE. You'll see that in the slideshow here. About 500 vertebrate species, probably more than 20,000 macroinvertebrate species, uh, meaning you know visible uh, invertebrates you can actually see without a microscope. And uh, that's a very crude estimate because there's been so little exploration of the, of the landscape. But uh, the four, four biomes are a couple of desert biomes to the south, and then the Rocky Mountain biome up to, to the north and northeast of us. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of narrowing down in spatial scope here to try to describe our landscape. We've jumped from the Colorado River Basin, this enormous basin, to the Grand Canyon ecoregion in the uh, north, but uh, really you have to put that in context of this biogeographic and um, geologic province uh, boundary. Colorado Plateau to the north, the Basin and Range Province to the south, these two large uh, uh, geologic provinces control a lot of the ecological processes and the species we have and the intervening transition valleys. What's remarkable about Arizona is we've got counties that fall in each of these. And so many of our kind of records are, are county based. We've got a northern tier of counties on the Colorado Plateau, a middle tier of counties that's in the transition valleys and a southern tier of counties that's in the Basin and Range Province. And so interesting there, because so many of our records are county-based, you can begin to look at, at uh, biodiversity across these boundaries. And then speaking specifically of Grand Canyon, this is a 1.2 million acre uh, landscape that the Park Service manages, about 1.8 million acres overall um, with, with the tribal lands and uh, adjacent Forest Service and BLM lands. Colorado River in Grand Canyon is 450 kilometers long, 278 miles. And if you were to put a cap on Grand Canyon, the volume of Grand Canyon is about 750 cubic kilometers, so we're getting about 250 uh, cubic miles. So it's an enormous landscape. From no point uh, on the rim can you see more than about 5% of the, of the overall landscape. It's a really enormous park with just incredible biodiversity 
very remote, very difficult to access, and therefore hard to get to know. It's also a landscape with, you know, with renowned for its geologic features and 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 uh, and for what we've learned about landscape change in, in relation to changing environments. The landscape as we see it here began to appear to us about uh, in a recognizable fashion about 15 million years ago or so. During the Pliocene, two to six million years ago, the, the region began to dry out because of the uplift of the Sierra Nevadas and the Basin Range Mountains created a rain shadow. And then a funny thing happened 2.6 million years ago, South America touched North America for the first time, allowing a tremendous faunal and floral interchange from South America northward and, and vice versa. During the Pleistocene times, lava flows, like you can see in this picture, dammed the dam Grand Canyon repeatedly. And if you had been standing on the rim of Grand Canyon half a million years ago, you would have been looking down into an enormous lake. During recent times, I've had you know, desertification and with global climate change, we're seeing more and more desert-like conditions set in here. So it's really been a, a land of, of tremendous uh, change and, and we can study that the effects of uh, landscape change on, on biota here uh, pretty well in Grand Canyon. It's also a landscape in which elevation matters tremendously. The elevation controls climate. So in terms of being able to study climate change, we can just go upslope to see what climate conditions were in the past and, down, and downslope to see kind of what they'll be in the future from any, from any one position. This is work started by Alexander von Humboldt in 1902, but the concept was taken up by Seahart Merriam in the mid, uh, mid 1890s and his expeditions out here defined these life zones on the basis of vegetation across the peaks. So it's, you know, we have just a st stupendous way to actually look at climate change in relation to, uh, to elevation here because of, of elevation's control on climate. Okay, we're talking about beetles today. So uh, the Bible of insect evolution is a book intriguingly called Insect Evolution by Grimaldi and Engel from 2005. It's a fabulous compilation of, the, of what we know from the fossil record about insects. And so what we know from that is that beetles arose during the Permian period, about 250, 260 billion years ago. Uh, they arose from ancestors that had radiated since mid, uh, out of the mid Paleozoic time, so 300 million years ago or so. The family we're going to talk about today, the stink beetles or Tenebrionidae, and their ancestors arose in mid Cretaceous time, so middle of the dinosaur phase of life. And by as early as 60 million years ago, we have genera that we can recognize today. And so some of the fossils of beetles that are out there. The sidereid looks kind of remarkably like a tiger beetle. The antennae are a little bit too well developed there for tiger beetles, but you know, you see that today, you say, oh, it's a tiger beetle. That's mid, mid Cretaceous times from amber. And similarly, some of the, the bark beetles uh, that we have from that time, 100 million years ago, we have beetles that look very much, dung beetles feeding on dinosaur poop from, from that time period. So the evolution of beetles has been this inc incredibly, glorious evolutionary adventure with many, many families of beetles. The five big ones are uh, the weevils, that's the biggest family, the uh, wood boring beetles, the cerebuses, longhorn wood borers, uh, leaf beetles, chrysomelids, scarabs, tenebrionids, uh, and, uh, and staphylinids. Tenebrionids are actually the fifth largest family of beetles. Uh, staphylinid beetles are rove beetles, a group with probably hundreds of undescribed species from here in the Southwest. And uh, we no longer have a taxonomist uh, working on this group in a, in a coherent way in the country uh, because our, our most recent taxonomist retired. And there's just so much more to learn about every one of these groups. But as you can see, this, it's a very complex history of evolution of beetles with most, uh, most of the groups arising after the Permo-Triassic extinction. Where does this fall in terms of the stack of rocks that we have when we're in Grand Canyon? Well, um, I love writing uh, you know, maps because you can put the uh, little asterisks on it saying, you are here. Well, uh, the, our museum, uh, those of us in Flagstaff are, are sitting on the top of the Kaibab limestone. It's about a 255, 260 million year old Permian limestone. Shortly after, shortly geologically, 10 million years after this limestone was laid down, the world's largest extinction event took place. Wiping out, it, that anything survived the Permo-Triassic extinction event is 
unbelievable because the conditions were so incredibly dire. Ocean temperatures of 100 degrees Fahrenheit globally, uh, a million years of acid rain coming out of volcanic eruptions from Siberia, unimaginable circumstances that life survived in. But that's where our kind of start of modern uh, Coleoptera, the, the order containing beetles, began. In looking at these extinction events, uh, this Permoa -Tri Triassic event was actually the, the third really major extinction event. Uh, we had some really massive events early in the uh, earlier in the Paleozoic, the late Ordovician times, uh, so three four hundred million years ago or so, late Devonian times, three hundred and sixty million years ago or so. During that that late Devonian event. We almost lost tetrapods. So we are tetrapods for limbs. The fossil record doesn't even show which of the couple of lineages that, existed, that were tetrapodal at that time period. That we don't know which group survived because we don't even have fossils of them. We are the uh, descendants of a ghost lineage that almost uh, disappeared during that, that, during that extinction event. Beetles arose between the, the, that and the Permo Triassic event. Uh, again, 95% of life on Earth, or Earth wiped out during the Permo Triassic times and in several other major extinction events that took place over Mesozoic time. The ongoing human caused uh, sixth extinction event hopefully will not be as massive as these, but it's just a, a question of, of a race against time as to who, who gets wiped out first, us or them. Okay, now we're trying to talk about the stink beetles. The family Tenebrionidae, these are called the darkling beetles or the stink beetles. What are these things? I'll talk today a little bit about their diversity, their evolution, their ecology, life history and physiology, uh, and their biogeography in, this, in the region of the Southwest here and in relation to Arizona. And we're looking at three landscapes, Grand Canyon as a, as a coherent landscape, uh, the Grand Canyon ecoregion, which is this 35, million square kilometer area around Grand Canyon and then all of Arizona. And uh, we'll look at responses to biodiversity in the Grand Canyon as a landform, as a large deep canyon landform, and look at levels of endemism, et cetera. So to get to know this family is a big task, really diverse. What in the world are these all things? They're not very colorful. That, that means that most people are kind of drawn to them like we are to butterflies or even the pleasing fungus beetles, which are pretty, pretty colorful critters. These are almost all dark colored, some of them very peculiar in their shape, living all kinds of different lives, mostly uh, decomposing their larvae or, or grubs that uh, feed on dead plant material for the most part. In the case of a fungus beetle here, these live in, in uh, bracken fungi, They're pretty common in the East. All right, to organize our thoughts about a group uh, that's as big as this, the fifth largest family of beetles, we have to look at their uh, taxonomy. 200 British biologists got together about 15 years ago and decided that fungi and animal cell division was so similar that they had to put us in the same kingdom. So now we and the fungi are in the, in the kingdom of Pistaconta. Tinebriotid beetles are arthropods, uh, they're mandibulate, they are in the pancrustacean superclass, including myriapods and crustaceans, and hexapods, which are insects. Uh, they're, we give them the order name beetle. Coleolus means shield. Terra means wing. And so the hard covering of the, of the abdomen, which is a, the first pair of wings on beetles, is the, re the reason they have their name. They're in the suborder polyphaga with a very diverse uh, group of, of relatives water beetles, rove beetles, scarab beetles, longhorn beetles, and leaf and snout beetles. The Tenebrionoidea is, a, is, a, is the a super family, including a lot of fungus beetles, uh, bark beetles, and darkling and blister beetles. And the, the families associated with Tenebrionidae include uh, very small families of forids, families that used to be in their own right, Aleculidae uh, used to be a standalone family, now been included in the Tenebrionids. Um, mostly soil, desert, and forest soil dwelling species. 19,000 species of Tenebrionids in 2000 genera worldwide. Now, remember, we have just 4,600 mammal species on Earth. So this is a family of beetles, one of hundreds of families of beetles, but uh, a family of beetles with almost five times the number of species of, of mammals in it. So it's huge work to try to put, to, to bring order to this, this level of taxonomy. 
How do we do that? We, we, look at the, we look at the external morphology and now the genetics of these things to try to tease them apart. So uh, uh, morphology of insects is, has been very well worked out, of course. The body plates are all uh, carefully described. Legs are very important for beetles and uh, particularly the, the number of tarsi. We don't have an analog for that in, in, uh, in our world because these are like kind of like phalanges maybe on one finger. Uh, but beetles have, they're, they're, they have a condition called their heteromerous, meaning that they have five phalanges, five of these tarsi uh, on, the, on the first and second pair of legs, and, but only four on the third pair of legs. So a, that's a big deal. The number of digits you have uh, in your hands, is, um, it's really a diagnostic feature, and it's the same as true for, for, for beetles. Beetles legs, unlike human legs, have a few other features, the coxa is the hip joint, if you would. The trochanter is, this, is a strange connector between the, the uh, hip joint and the, and the femur, the tibia, and then these they're called kind of toe-like things called tarsi. But uh, very diagnostic. You can tell a tenebrionid from, say, a, a ground beetle immediately by looking at the number of tarsi they have. How do these things live? Mealworms are, um, they have a whole, uh, a, a whole metabolist lifestyle four life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So like butterflies and moths and flies and the higher insect groups, uh, and unlike things like dragonflies and grasshoppers and, and uh, water striders and whatnot. So uh, this is a called a holometabolous life cycle. Now, in terms of tenebrionid uh, diversity uh, in relation to beetles, beetles about 350,000 species described thus far hundreds of thousands of undescribed species globally, likely many undescribed species right here in our own, own neighborhood. There are not as many species of beetles as there are of parasitic hymenoptera. Parasitoidea is a huge uh, group of, ins of, uh, of insects of which we know very little about taxonomically. So most of those species haven't been described yet. And eventually they'll, uh, they'll supersede the number of beetles that we have. As I said, stink beetles, darkling beetles are the fifth largest family but it's a, it's a complex and poorly synthesized taxonomy so far, but improving because, especially because of genetic work and the, and the work of people like Aaron Smith and Charles Triplehorn and, and Rolf Albu and others. The family of Tenebrionidae is divided into 11 subfamilies, 49 tribes, 200 genera. And in America, we have 1,335 species described so far. A favorite analog, uh, a story from pretty much any coleopterist you'll talk to is that when uh, J.B.S. Haldane, a very famous uh, evolutionary biologist, asked about the nature of the creator based on his uh, Haldane's studies of life, he said, well, God must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles with all this biodiversity. So it's a really uh, vast uh, universe of information about beetles that, uh, that we have available to us. Here in Grand Canyon uh, and in Arizona, Tenebriana diversity is Amazing. We have 122 uh, within the Grand Canyon ecoregion, 122 taxa, meaning uh, subspecies, among at least 116 species in 48 genera, 18 tribes, and six subfamilies of the uh, of the family of Tenebrionidae. Uh, overall, in Arizona, more than 400 species, almost 500 taxa, 103 genera, 31 tribes, and seven subfamilies. Arizona supports more than 14 and a half percent. Of the, of the 2,825 species that occur in all of North America and, and Greenland. And with the work we're doing, we've added 126 taxa to the state total. So that's, that's impressive. We're trying to get a paper out on that uh, within the next few months here. Please let me know if you're interested in that paper. I'm happy, happy to send it to you when it comes out. Now, deeping on beetles, they don't have much medical value so far as we know. Therefore, they get rather little study. They're also not, most of them are not pests. However, uh, tribolium is a well-known grain storage pest that can, that can actually cause a, a serious economic damage. Mealworms are used as, you know, bait and as uh, aquarium uh, fish food and, and for feeding other, uh, other pets uh, sometimes. So there's some, uh, some economic value there. We have in Grand Canyon region, a, uh, a group of beetles called, uh, in the genus Hymenorus, that Steve Crothers called the mystery beetle because they, they have bigger population eruptions and literally fill water containers and everything else in the very um, pestiferous. So that group is actually of economic consideration to people like river runners who are 
trying to, you know, operate at night with lights and having these things come in and fill all their water water bottles and whatnot. This is a, a strange group, very poorly known. The whole story could be given about uh, about their taxonomy. But if you talk to the Hopi or the Zuni or uh, some of the other tribes in the area, Tenebriana beetles have a lot of cultural story to them. They tend to show up in relation to rains. And so the Hopi have a, have a whole song about stink beetles. I get to hear that uh, here at the museum one time and uh, sure wish I'd recorded it. But the part of the story is that uh, when you encounter these beetles, and they're quite large, very conspicuous, if you see them as you're walking around, they might feel the vibrations of your feet and do a headstand and point their butts at you. The genus Aleotes produces a, a benzoquinone alkane a substance that is quite uh, noxious. They, they produce it in specialized glands and they use it to, like skunks to spray at their enemies. For them, their, enemy, their main enemies are grasshopper mice, which of course try to eat them. So this is where the, the name stink beetle comes from. Uh, there are whole genera of beetles that mimic the behavior of, of this headstand uh, behavior, uh, but, don't pr but, but don't contain the, uh, you know, the, uh, the musk. So uh, for example, Stenomorpha uh, is something we call a Batesian mimic where a, a harmless form imitates a noxious form. A good guy imitates a bad guy in order to to uh, uh, ward off enemies. So Batesian mimicry is, is quite common with this very distinctive behavior that, that uh, the Eleodes and, and related beetles have, have developed. So chemical defense is part of the ecology of these things. It was an interesting way of, of uh, securing defense from enemies. Jumping into other, another topic, distribution of these species across elevation. Now, this is where, for me, it gets kind of interesting. And the only reason we can put these kind of uh, stories together is because for the last 50 years, we've been collecting tenebrionid beetles pretty assiduously throughout the Southwest. And we can begin to look at elevation patterns among them. The top graph here is the number of species across elevation. And so in ecology, we've come to expect to see this as a uh, unimodal curve. A, hump, a humpback curve. And part of the reason for that uh, has to do with land area, because we have so much more land area, typically at low elevations, than we do at high elevations. Uh, and because land area is related to the number of species that can be supported through island bi biogeography, what we expect to see normally now is this unimodal curve if you just look at the number of species across elevation. Uh, because we have this tremendous elevation gradient, of course, that gives us the opportunity to do this. And I've divided this into the, the patterns on the Colorado Plateau, which is a little bit lower than the pattern of, of species uh, richness across elevation in, on the, uh, basin, in the Basin and Range province to the south. That's normal because as you go farther and farther northward and you, you begin to uh, run out of species, we have a strong pattern, of course, of more species in the tropics, fewer in the temperate regions, and you know, typically none in the ar Arctic regions. So as you go farther uh, northward, you, the species tend to drop out. So this pattern makes good sense, uh, adding it up for the, uh, for the entire state of Arizona, unimodal curve, that all makes sense. Now, if we take that biodiversity and scale it to the land area associated with those different elevations, this takes a, this takes a very sophisticated GIS work, Jerry Ledbetter, Jeff Janess in our lab at the uh, uh, Museum of Northern Arizona uh, do this kind of work for me. And uh, that we can begin to see a pattern there. What we expect to see is a linear decrease if you, if you adjust for species abundance, the, the number of species uh, by area, in other words, creating the species density, we expect to see a decrease in density as you move up in elevation uh, because of that land area uh, issue, more land at the at lower elevation, less land at the highest elevations, just a couple of uh, square kilometers of alpine habitat on the top of the San Francisco peaks up above 3000 meters, for example. So we expect to see a decline in, in species density as you move up in elevation. Anyway, we've got this expected pattern which holds on the Colorado Plateau, and yet it does not hold for the, for the Basin and Range province. There, we see a unimodal curve, even across species density. How do we account for that? Well, 
we see this sag kind of in the species density relationship on the Colorado Plateau, these lands are plateau lands. Uh, uniform habitat, not much habitat diversity, and that is probably partly why we're, we're seeing this kind of flattening of that, curve, that portion of the curve. In the uh, Basin and Range province, this is the Sky Islands, the, the, the range of, of land in the Sky Islands, very diverse habitat, and uh, habitat diversity also kicks the species richness up. But of course, as you get to higher elevations, again, there, uh, as everywhere, you run out of habitat and, and uh, very few species are adapted to those cold climates at higher elevations. So there may be a landscape configuration pattern uh, going on in these kind of data. Quite exciting to do this. Be great to do this with, uh, with quite a few different species as we've, we've started to do, we've done this with dragonflies, butterflies, tiger beetles, uh, mosquitoes, et cetera. Tenebriana beetles are the first group we've been able to look at this across the entire state. So kind of an exciting pattern to begin to look at there and one that we couldn't have gotten to without 50 years of assiduous collecting and identification of these species, largely thanks to, to uh, Charles Triplehorn uh, for his incredible lifetime of, of commitment to this group of beetles. All right, so we've explored now some of the relationships of ecology, taxonomy, diverse of uh, Tenebriana beetles. Tenebriana beetles are, have very limited mobility. Some of, most of them can't fly. Many of, some of them can, but, but most of them can't fly. They don't travel very far. They are in very little way do they actually resemble highly mobile creatures like uh, butterflies or dragonflies. This month, we've just finished up a book on the dragonflies of damaged supplies of Grand Canyon, thanks to Jerry Ledbetter's book designing skills. And uh, this will, the book will come out probably in early February, maybe late January. In it, we document that there are 89 species in seven families of dragonflies in the Grand Canyon region. Dragonflies, of course, are, uh, many of them are very highly mobile, huge, uh, huge ranges across uh, vast portions of North America. But the similarities with Tenebriana beetles are that very low levels of endemism, uh, Odo is for Odonata, that means uh, square jawed, square jawed critters. Um, there's, there's only one endemic uh, uh, species in Grand Canyon. And, they're, and they also share with Tenebriana beetles that we actually know about their gamma diversity, their regional species richness and distribution. So you have to have that to be able to really understand what the role of, uh, of mobility is in shaping, in shaping diversity. So we're contrasting a highly mobile group with uh, the Tenebrianas, which are uh, remarkably non-mobile. So here are the basics of, uh, of species richness among the, uh, these two groups. Obviously much higher richness of Tenebriana beetles than dragonflies overall, and in terms of both species level and genus level diversity. But the question we can ask with these two very different groups is, uh, does mobility influence biodiversity? So how do we get at this? So what we can do is compare the ratios of species occurring in, in these different landscapes of different areas within our region for both the Tenebriana beetles and the dragonflies. And what we find is when we compare Grand Canyon to, to the Grand Canyon ecoregion, Tenebriana, uh, there's about a 32% species sharing across those two landscapes. When we compare Grand Canyon to, uh, to the state of Arizona, that for Tenebriana beetles, quite a low percentage of, of, uh, of species shared. So meaning there's, there's a lot of species with smaller ranges and then comparing Grand Canyon ecoregion with Arizona as a whole, you know, about a third of the fauna is shared between those two areas. One third of the fauna of Arizona is found in Grand Canyon ecoregion. So rather low, proportion of tenebriana beetles in relation to this, these landscape, uh, changing landscape sizes. The turnover of species is quite low compared to dragonflies, which you know, have two or three times as many species shared across these landscape areas. Small percentages here mean that, the beetle, that these tenebriana beetles that are so numerous have a smaller range in the landscape. And despite the four to five fold greater species richness, low mobility tenebrionids are relatively depauperate in Grand Canyon as compared to highly mobile dragonflies and damselflies. Highly mobile species are much more widespread. Diversity of these critters is in large part uh, a reflection of their mobility and their, the size of their ranges across the landscape. So 
to get to this information, again, it's taken 50 years of understanding what the, what the regional diversity is, uh, but it's, uh, it's been uh, a wonderful challenge to do this. And as we do this kind of analysis with more and more groups of species, spiders, you name uh, whatever, whatever group, um, as we do that with more and more species, checking out mobility, we can get a better, a clearer picture of this story. I can't wait to get to the millipedes, which are about the most sedentary group of critters we can imagine. Snails also are another group, very interesting to look at with this. So anyway, right now it looks like mobility controls diversity. We also have a, uh, a situation here in Grand Canyon in which we have, uh, despite this small range size factors, uh, these creature, creatures living in fairly restricted habitats, you think that would promote more endemism, but we really only have a couple examples of endemic species of Tenebriana beetles in Grand Canyon. One of the most interesting is one that I helped discover. The Shadow Moxies follator is, uh, is, is a beetle that lives in rock shelters and caves in Grand Canyon. It's the only place you find it. It doesn't fly, doesn't move around very much. It stays within these rock shelters. In some settings, it's the primary prey of an endemic Grand Canyon brown recluse spider lux. So also these type of events is kind of an interesting a uh, highly endemized, very uh, short food web in dry Grand Canyon caves. So this is a, a creature that is completely restricted to caves in Grand Canyon and how its, you know, its genetics would be really fascinating to look at. And we, I hope to, to be able to, to get into this because it, it does occur all the way through Grand Canyon, but only in these rock shelter habitats. It can't fly, it can't cross the river. It's, a, it's quite an, a, an interesting critter to look at as an endemic species. We have another endemic Tenebrionidae in Grand Canyon, also a cave dweller that lives in the, in the cave of the domes off of Horseshoe Mesa there. Unfortunately, no photos uh, are available for that species, but it's a larger Tenebriana beetle, looking more like a, uh, one of the normal stink beetles. Anyway, so some interesting stories of, of uh, endemism among Tenebriana beetles within Grand Canyon, but actually very few of those kind of stories. Most species are not endemic. They're found within and, uh, and extending some distance outside the Grand Canyon. To wrap up our, our discussion of Tenebrionidae, by diving in deeply on one family, I hope to kind of illuminate some of the processes and patterns we're getting to look at through the music from the Museum of Northern Arizona, looking at this, uh, the landscape we live in here. The Tenebrionidae is a large family of ground dwelling species with very di uh, great diversity of life histories and ecology. The, the Grand Canyon region supports a, a rich and yet relatively limited diversity of Tenebrionidae. A lot of species, but in terms of the overall gamma diversity, it's a relatively low diversity group. Interesting kind of uh, element there. The group has limited mobility uh, that, uh, uh, and that reduces its relative diversity in this large deep canyon as compared to more highly mobile taxa like dragonflies. Few endemics in the landscape, but here's something interesting. This is a group of beetles that are, are geologically long-lived species. They may live, the species may last millions of years in contrast to most mammals, which uh, it's really rare for a mammal species to, to last for more than, you know, even a, a half a million years. Uh, but uh, some of these beetle species may be five to 10 million years old. And they may actually predate the development of Grand Canyon as a landform. Like Grand Canyon is, you know, widely regarded to be about five and a half, six million years old. Some of these beetle species may be older than the landscape that's developed at Grand Canyon. So more exploration is needed, genetics, as well as more basic biology on, on the distribution of these species and other species in this large deep canyon uh, landscape. And how this feature we call Grand Canyon influences the life in and around it. All right, so why bother studying an obscure taxon like this. Maybe some of you have never even heard of the Tenebrionid beetles before. This is one of literally thousands of, of uh, groups of organisms from which we can learn something about the earth. So each organism we encounter has a personal and taxonomic evolutionary story and a, a history as rich or richer than our own personal stories. We learn how to live and honor our fellows, the life on earth, and these uh, creatures through the study of, of these and their and past life forms, human and otherwise. These are some of my heroes, Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, E.O. Wilson, many other incredibly thoughtful people that have spent their life uh, really coming to, trying to come to terms with 
how we understand uh, biodiversity on, on the planet. Another hero, the, uh, Theodore Dobchansky said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And learning about evolution, learning about how these species are shaped by evolutionary process, by geologic process, over geologic time, is just a tremendous adventure. And so, I, you know, this is what we try to do at the museum is try to bring this, this research into, into focus within our landscape here and really uh, highlight this, the uh, organisms we have in this landscape, honor them and try to understand how uh, we all got to be here. Uh, I have a few other thoughts. I think the important parts here are that we don't really understand that much about the world around us. Every scientist I talk to, I ask them if we know 5% of what we need to about their science. Physicists are not even at 1%. Chemists are shy in, in, in almost everything they, they, they talk about. When it comes to biology and uh, evolutionary ecology, the, the field that I study, if we're at 1%, that would be great. If we're at 5%, that'd be nearly miraculous. There's so much more to learn. We, I try to approach everything I do with humility and try to see the other side, side of every story that's, uh, that's presented. To get to know someone, walk a mile in their tar seat. Try to understand what life is like for a Tadebrionid beetle that you come across as you're, walking, as you're doing your daily walk. I think we learn most by testing the limits of our own awareness and perception uh, and the ways that belief obscures our vision and ability to learn. As a scientist, that's kind of the foundation on which I built my life. And it's so important to test biases and try to understand what we do and don't know in, and, uh, and how our beliefs shape what we think we do know. Lastly, I'd just like to uh, recommend that be as generous as you can. Support, uh, support institutions and people who are doing things that you are, are drawn to, including uh, organizations like the Museum of Northern Arizona, which is a beacon of culture and, and uh, research here in Northern Arizona. All right, with that, I'll wrap it up. There's a question about whether the two sides of the river are different as, as far as what beetles there are. Really good question. So the two sides of the river, you know, the Colorado River has occasionally dried up. Flows can drop uh, very low or even dry up. And so when that happens, species that are on one side, especially that are, you know, capable of walking uh, uh, pretty quickly, like some of these Tenebriana beetles are, they could actually walk across the river. Does that explain the range of species like Eliotes uh, longiculus, uh, the, uh, this large um, beetle without uh, striations on the elytra that you commonly encounter on both sides of the river. We can't know that until we get into the genetics and see what kind of separation there actually is. It, um, again, the species could actually be older than Grand Canyon and therefore just kind of gradually diverging without, without morphologically changing very much. These are Really great questions to ask, and uh, we don't have the genetics data to be able to, uh, to understand that question yet. We do have uh, good examples of, of species and subspecies found on one side, but not on the other, like Kaibab squirrel, like uh, the Utah versus uh, Arizona gopher snake, whole species like skinks, uh, some of the skinks occur, uh, Skiltonianus occurs on the north side, of Multivergatish occurs on the south side, so entire species are divided by the river. There's a really wonderful story of giant land snails, an entire family occurring almost exclusively on the north side of the river, a different family of, land, of giant land snails occurring uh, on the south side. So the river is a barrier, but it may vary a lot by the, by the kind of species we're talking about and the age of that species. Thank you, very good question. And that was a great answer. And there's a follow-up, another question. Does the dung source affect evolution? We have to go to the evolution of the Aphrodini to be able to really look at that question. Uh, the dung beetles have been with us since the time of the dinosaurs, with us, uh, us in the larger sense of our lineage that goes back for almost 4 billion years. Dung beetles, well, they're more adapted to the size of the dung producing organism than they are to the specific dung, as far as I can tell. Yes, they would be uh, sensitive to whether that's a, 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 an herbivore versus a predatory large creature. So we generally don't find dung beetles uh, going after predator poop, but, uh, but, but after herbivore poop. Uh, so for vegetarian 
Presbyterian dinosaurs, there probably were dung beetles rolling their balls of dung out of the poop of those dinosaurs, just as they still do for many species here in the United States and in Africa. The group seems to have arisen in Africa uh, and then moved, jumped continents to, uh, to South America and North America out of, that, uh, out of the African origin. And that, of course, would have, that uh, orig origination would have taken place back in, the, in Cretaceous times, 100 million years ago. So there would, could well have been lots of dinosaur dung for them to feed on and, and develop in. And as, as they were able to survive the, uh, the uh, Cretaceous tertiary extinction event, when we lost the dinosaurs, it took about 10 million years for, for mammal life to begin then. And we're here because of that extinction event. Mammals radiated because of that extinction event. Uh, but pretty quickly, larger herbivorous mammals began to appear and those beetles were able to take advantage of, uh, of that source of dung. And so they're still with us. Again, the beetles are, uh, were able to survive these big extinction events because they're often fossorial. They, they burrow into the earth and uh, can be protected from the environmental tragedies that are going on out, uh, out around them. Well, thank you. This has been really fascinating as usual, Larry. Thanks everybody for, for being with us.